أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وآله الطاهرين verse number 150 ومن حيث خرجت فول وجهك شطر المسجد الحرام وحيث ما كنتم فول وجوهكم شطره لألا يكون للناس عليكم حجة إلا الذين ظلموا منهم فلا تخشوهم بخشوني ولأتم نعمتي عليكم ولعلكم تهتدون and wherever you may go out turn your face towards the holy mosque and wherever you may be turn your faces towards it so that the people may have no argument against you neither those of them except those of them who are wrongdoers so do not fear them but fear me that i may complete my blessing on you and so that you may be guided uh, you will see that there is a repetition here regarding the change of qibla three or four times this is because in every case Allah mentions one reason for it first of all of course it was because the Prophet was turning his face towards the the sky all the time waiting for the revelation to come secondly because Allah says this is the truth which is already mentioned and will have mentioned that it would happen and has happened now thirdly turn your face towards masjid al-haram so that people have no argument against you what argument people had the argument would have been twofold first of all that okay if you are a new prophet if you are an independent religion why you don't have an independent qibla? the second argument would have been that we have in our previous books that the last prophet would pray towards two qibla. so why this prophet does not pray towards two qibla? now there is no hujja after this change of qibla, there is no hujja over you no one can argue against you now that this has happened except the wrongdoers who no matter whatever proof and evidence you show them they are going to argue so do not fear them the fear was always that the Jews would argue against the Muslims rightfully now there are those who do it wrongfully so do not worry about the wrongdoers you fear me and follow what I say. One of the things that this, these verses tell us is that how important was the views of the Jews for the Muslims of Medina, what they said about their religion, what they said about their faith. They were very influential and they actually had some sort of sway on the mind of Muslims especially those who lived in Medina before, because as I said, they, they, they usually held Ahlul Kitab, the Jews, uh, highly. It, it, they, were very, they had very high esteem in their minds. So when they criticized, they were very sensitive about the faith. And now Allah says, do not fear them. Even if they criticize, they are criticizing wrongfully and not rightfully. ni'mati so that and also so that I by this change of Qibla I complete my ni'mah over you what's this ni'mah we completed apparently this is the ni'mah of giving them an independent faith an independent religion a religion which with its own identity separate from the identity of uh, the uh, Jewish religion which was because of the 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 sameness of the Qibla, because the Qibla was the same. There was this merge of identity. Now this identity has been uh, separated. And in this way, the ni'mah has been completed. The other meaning of ni'mati alaykum is that by following my instructions, I will complete my ni'mah over you in this world 
and in the next world. Of course, we have in hadith that uh, it is uh, reported from the Prophet, peace be upon him, tamamun ni'ma dukhulul jannah. The ni'ma will be completed when a person enters paradise. That is the real ni'ma. And that's why we say that the, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, in Surah Ma'adah says that atmamtu alaykum ni'mati, it means wilaya, because it's by this wilaya people can enter paradise. And therefore the completion of ni'mah is actually will take place after we have passed the sirat and have entered the paradise. So by doing this, I will complete my ni'mah over you, وَلَعَلَّكُمْ تَحْتَدُونَ And also, this is a new guidance which has come to you and you will be guided. Verse number 151, كَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا فِيكُمْ رَسُولًا مِّنْكُمْ يَتْلُوا عَلَيْكُمْ آيَاتِنَا وَيُزَكِّيكُمْ وَيُعَلِّمُكُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ وَيُعَلِّمُكُمْ مَا لَمْ تَكُونُوا تَعْلَمُونَ As we send to you an, a messenger from among yourselves who recites to you our signs and purifies you and teaches you the book and wisdom, and teaches you what you did not know. Now, you remember when Ibrahim was actually building the house, he made a dua. And the dua was that, Rabbana wab'ath fihim rasul in my progeny, who are ummatan muslimatan lak, uh, appoint a, a messenger to purify them, to teach them book and wisdom. Now, the Qibla is changed towards the Kaaba, which was built by, the, by, by Ibrahim alayhi salam. And also, now we have done two things for you. First of all, we changed the Qibla to Kaaba. And secondly, this is like what we did, like the favor we did to you before. We sent you a messenger. Due to the dua of Ibrahim alayhi salam, we sent you a messenger. Sometimes one wonders how dua, how long the dua may go, isn't it? 2,500 years ago, Ibrahim made a dua, and the dua is fulfilled now among the people of Mecca, among the Ummat and Muslimah. So, kama uh, arsal nafikum apparently is, uh, is attached to le utimma ni'mati alaykum. I complete my ni'ma to you in the same way as I appointed a messenger to you. Remember my favors. My favors have been so huge on you. So if I sent you this great ni'ma, if I made this great favor of sending a messenger from you, I will complete my ni'ma to you in due course. كَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا فِيكُمْ رَسُولًا مِنْكُمْ We sent to you a messenger from you. From who? Of course, from the Arabs who had no scripture before. Not from the Jews. Now, as you found a religion with a messenger from among you, now you have a qibla of your own as well. You are completely now an uh, an independent identity. Kama arsal nafikum rasulan minkum. Now, what does this rasul do? Yatlu alaykum ayatina. First of all, you did not know any about, anything about revelation. You didn't have any scripture. You didn't read any book. Now, this messenger reads to you the revelation. And you are now having a book. Now, you see how this ni'mah is getting completed. The messenger. The book, guidance, qibla, the, the, the direction, everything now is being completed for the uh, people to whom this messenger was sent, the ummiyin. I have mentioned this repeatedly. Ummiyin were, uh, were those who did not have any scripture, were those who were not Jews, and Jews called them ummiyin, meaning they are nations other than Jews. So. For the Ummiyin, Allah has sent a messenger, minhum, from among the Ummiyin, have given them the book, identity, direction for prayer, yatlu alaykum ayatana, revelation, wa and purifies you. 
these three things exactly are those three things that uh, Ibrahim actually requested from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by sending this messenger. What is purification? He purifies you from internal evils and from external evils, from the apparent evils and from hidden, hidden evils. Hidden evils are what? Shirk, kufr, uh, uh, grudge, jealousy. These are hidden evils which this messenger would purify you if you follow them. Apparent evils like, for example, uh, fornication, adultery, uh, doing indecent things in public, these are the uh, apparent evils. And this is what Allah mentions, وَذَرُوا al الْإِثْمِ وَبَاطِنَا Leave the ithm, the sin, whether it's apparent or it's hidden. Both of them you have to leave. So this messenger would purify you of all these evils, hidden evils, apparent evils. وَيُعَلِّمُكُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ And he teaches you kitab. Kitab is different from, of course, those ayat. Kitab are, apparently, if we want to make a difference, is what is written for you in terms of uh, rituals, in terms of instructions. So, salat is a kitab. إِنَّ salat كَانَتْ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ كِتَابًا مَوْغُوتًا Salat is a written obligation for the mu'mineen, which has a specific time. So, Hajj, Zakat, these are the kitab. He teaches you what to do in terms of worship. One of the most important things that every believer should, uh, should know is what is my responsibility towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And these are the instructions which are given by the messengers, by prophets. This is, called, this is what we call kitab. Hikmah is the theology, is the belief, the teachings, which we have to believe in, taught to us by messengers. So when we use kitab and hikmah uh, as opposed to each other, kitab are the instructions, the practical instructions that we have to follow. And hikmah is, OK, who is God? How, do this, how, how should we describe him? Uh, what is going to happen, for example, after this life, philosophy of life, all these are hikmah, these are wisdom. So, what does this messenger do? And this is the ni'mah that I sent to you, in the same way that I sent a messenger, I'm going to complete my ni'mah for you. This messenger, first of all, he reads for you the revelation, so gives you a book. Secondly, purifies you from evil. Thirdly, teaches you the kitab, what is written for you by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and fourthly teaches you hikmah, the philosophy of life, the philosophy of creation. Of course, he teaches you what you would not know by your own. There are many things that we can know by our own. Like, for example, how this world, world is working, about technology, science, all these things we can know by ourselves. But there are things, like for example, there are angels in this world. There's going to be life after death. These are the things that we cannot know by our own. So he will teach you what you would not have known by yourself on your own. فَذْكُرُونِي أَذْكُرْكُمْ وَاشْكُرُوا لِي so, now that if this is the case, that I have given you your qibla now, I've sent you a messenger to you and done all those things, so remember me. And if you remember me, I will remember you and thank me. And if you thank me, of course I will increase in other verses it's mentioned, and do not be ungrateful to me. Now, there are two very interesting uh, opposites in the Quran. That here it says, Fadhkuruni Azkurkum. You remember me, I remember you. And in other verse we have Nasulla Fanasiyahum. They forget Allah, Allah forgets them. Apparently, uh, Everything with re in relation to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, except the, the ni'mah that he has given to every human being, if we want to go closer to him, 
things should initiate from us, and then blessings come from him. So we remember him, then the blessings come down. He remembers, this is the meaning of he remembers you. Blessings come. We forget him, the blessings don't come down. That means that's the meaning of he forgets you. So you remember him, he remembers you. You put yourself, you somehow expose yourself, put yourself at the disposal of that blessing, and you will get it. You block that, you turn away, you don't get it. So it's very important, uh, and this is uh, actually one of those verses which talks about the absolute free will of human being in terms of receiving the blessings of Allah. And this is, of course, not the material blessing, mainly the spiritual blessings. You remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will remember you and his blessings will come. Now, we, what type of blessing is this? Because we see that there are many nations, many individuals, they don't believe in God to remember him at all. And they receive many blessings, whether individually or socially. So apparently these blessings, this is not the type of blessing that we understand or we expect from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us, for example, health, good life, security. This is something different. This, this is due to certain other actions. However, remembrance of God brings the spiritual blessings down. Forgetting Allah blocks the spiritual blessings and stops us elevating up to him. And therefore, uh, in many narrations, we have that uh, the way you remember Allah, Allah will remember you in that way. Let me read one uh, hadith for you, or a couple of hadith for you. There is a hadith from the Prophet, peace be upon him, قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمُ يَقُولُ اللَّهُ أَنَا عِنْدَ ذَنَّ عَبْدِي بِهِ I am standing where my servant thinks of me, how he expects me, I stand there. In, in fact, your expectation of Allah is the measure you receive blessings from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You expect hugely, he gives hugely. You expect little, he gives little. And mainly this is in spiritual terms rather than in physical and material terms. When he remembers me, I am with him. So if you want to be close to Allah, you have to remember him. If you don't remember him, he goes. I mean, as, so to speak, he goes. I am with him as long as he remembers me. فَإِنْ ذَكَرَنِي فِي نَفْسِهِ ذَكَرْتُهُ فِي نَفْسِهِ He remembers me in himself, inwardly. I remember him and gives him blessings in his heart. فَإِنْ ذَكَرَنِي فِي مَلَئٍ ذَكَرْتُهُ فِي مَلَئٍ خَيْرٌ مِنْهُمْ خَيْرٌ مِنْهُمْ If he remembers me in public, I remember him in a congregation which is much better than the congregation or the pu public that he remembers me in the congregation of the angels. They, we become well known there. in taqarraba ilayya shibran taqarrabtu ilayhi dhira'an. If he comes close to me one cubit, say one meter, I go to him 10 meters. If he comes to me 10 meters, I go to him 100 meters. If he comes to me walking, I go to him running. In essence, what is this? Because these, these are all metaphorical things. In essence, it means that if you want to grow spiritually, if you want to go closer to Allah, the key for it is remembering him. And when you remember him, this door opens. If you forget him, this door closes. Nasullah fanasiyahum. They forget Allah, Allah forgets them. And what is remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Because remembrance is a very general term. 
here Allah says, Fadkuruni Azkurkum. Remembrance of Allah, the scholars say that remembrance of Allah are three of three types. One type is you say by your tongue, you subhanallah, alhamdulillah. This is something, this is what we usually call dhikr, isn't it? This ta'aribat we do after salat is, is dhikr. Or some dhikr we say daily, for example. This is dhikr by tongue. The other one is practical zikr, zikr by action. What does that mean? It means that, for example, when it's time of salat, you go and pray. The prayer itself is a zikr by tongue. But the fact that you go, you make wudu, you start your prayers, even if you pray absent-mindedly, you are still in remembrance of Allah. Why? Because you are doing this practically. Fasting is remembrance of Allah. Paying charity and zakat is remembrance of Allah. Doing any good work for the sake of Allah. This is very, very important. Sometimes we get confused because many people do many good things and we say, okay, is this zikr Allah? No. As we have this very, very famous hadith from A'imah alayhi wa salam. La qawla illa bil amal. There is no word accepted except by action. If I really say something, I have to show it in my action. Wala qawla, wala amala illa bin niyya. There is no action and no amal, no word and no action except by intention. You have to do it. If this is going to be dhikrullah, of course you can do it without dhikrullah and it has its own result. But if you want it to be dhikrullah, you have to do it with intention. This is qurbatan illallah. And wala qawla, wala amala, wala niyata illa bi isabat sunnah. Also, you cannot just uh, made up something, some sort of worship from yourself. It should be according to the sunnah of the, a messenger, a prophet. Now, either our prophet or any other prophet, it should be according to that sunnah. So there's practical, there was, there's zikr by tongue, practical zikr, what we do every day, when we wake up, for example, for salat in fajr, as I said, even if it's not absent-mindedly, but you are remembering God. That's why you wake up. That's why you make wudu. That's why you go and stand for prayer. This is dhikrullah. And there is also remembering him in terms of his blessings. Wa dhikru alaihi. Dhikru alaihi. Wa dhikru na'amaihi. Wa dhikru khaliq as wal You remember his ni'mah. You remember his greatness. You remember the creation. This is Contemplation. So there is word, there is action, and there is contemplation. These are three types of dhikr. So if this dhikr comes to the amount this dhikr is there, the blessings come. And this is the meaning of Allah remembering you. Of course, Allah doesn't forget anything. The meaning of this remembrance is that to the extent you remember him, the blessings come on you. And the benefit of it shows itself in this world, but not as much as it shows itself in the next world. And that's why, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, udhukurullah dhikran kathira. Remember Allah abundantly because, of course, the benefits of it will come to you. Let me uh, read a couple of more beautiful hadiths in this respect. قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم مثل الذي يذكر ربه والذي لا يذكر لا يذكر ربه مثل الحي والميت The example of a person who remembers God and a person who doesn't remember God is like a living person and a dead person. Of course, this is the life of the heart. Remembrance of Allah is life of the heart and forgetful of Allah is death. Of the heart. Also, there is this beautiful hadith, uh, again from the Prophet, peace be upon him. These hadiths are, of course, uh, common between Shia and Sunni. Man ata Allah faqad Allah. Whoever obeys God has remembered God. 
وَإِنْ قَلَّتْ صَلَاتُهُ وَسِيَامُهُ وَتَلَوَتُهُ لِلْقُرْآنِ Even if their salat and fast and recitation of the Qur'an is little, they just suffice with the wajibat. They don't do any nafila, they don't do any salatul layl, but they obey God. When they go to business, they are very careful. In dealing with family, with friends, they are very careful. They do not do back, backbiting. They do not wrong anyone. They do not wrong any member of the family. This is ita'atullah. So even if their salat and siyam and fast is little, this is remembrance of Allah. وَمَنْ أَصَلَّهَا فَقَدْ نَسِيَ اللَّهِ Whoever disobeys Allah has forgotten Allah. وَإِنْ كَثُرَتْ صَلَاتُهُ وَسِيَامُهُ وَتَلَوَتُهُ لِلْقُرَانِ Even if they do salat and fast and recite the Quran abundantly, but if they are disobeying Allah, you may say, is it possible someone who do fast and pray and comes to mosque all the time disobeys Allah? Yes, it's possible. And we have seen examples of it. We have seen examples of people who are very popular in the mosque, but when go, they go home, everyone is afraid of them because of their akhlaq and their bad mood and things like that. So this is disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So disobedience of Allah is forgetting him. No matter how much you say dhikr in, by your tongue, obeying Allah, even if you don't say anything except you do your salat, your wajib salat, then of course you are in remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the final hadith I want to mention here, uh, and the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yaqul, yaqulullah ya ibn Adam, innaka idha ma dhakartani, shakartani, wa idha ma nasaytani, kafartani. If you remember me, you have thanked me. If you forget me, you have been ungrateful to me. And this is of course, uh, very clear. We may do very many good things, but we do not remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In fact, we are ungrateful to him, and we are doing good to others by the things that he has given us without remembering him, without mentioning him. This is, of course, ungratefulness. So, fadhkuruni adhkurkum washkuru li wala takfurun. Another question here is, why should we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And... Uh, because this thankfulness doesn't reach him. By, by not reaching him, it means that he's not taking any benefit of it. He doesn't feel better when we thank him. Of course, we human beings, when someone thanks us, we feel better, isn't it? We feel somehow uh, gratified. But for Allah, this is not there. So what's the benefit of this shock given to Allah? Again, anything in this... Uh, vain that we think the benefit should come back to us. Any worship we do, we have to think of its benefit in terms of our own selves. If we thank Allah, what is thankfulness? Thankfulness is to know that what you have is from him. That's, that's thankfulness. Someone asked, uh, Musa was uh, this conversation with Musa salam, that he said, Ya Allah, how can I thank you? While everything you give to me, even this tank is from you, he said, this is when you are thanking me. Knowing that everything is from me is you are thanking me. Now, why this thankfulness? Again, the benefit comes to us because this makes us humble towards Allah. This softens our hearts towards Allah. This makes us to feel obedient towards him, to be patient towards his decisions, what decisions he makes, which may not be desirable for us, this shokr would always bring all these things, and therefore, this is something which benefits us. And uh, now, this is the end of, this verse is the end of the, the, the series of verses talking about Qibla. Verse number 153 turns to a new subject, inshallah, we deal with it next week. Wa sallallahu ala Muhammadin wa Thank you, Sheikh. Uh, so we continue with some discussion. Uh,
Um, just picked up this Omiyin for a minute. I know we have discussed it before. Yes. But then again, is it not true that in Islam, as in any other religion, when it is at its peak, or when it's too recognized, then there are some things which maybe come with the victories. For example, if I may give you an example of, um, in this day and age, the blood transfusion and organ donation. Uh, if I remember correctly, you're allowed to give, sorry, you're allowed to receive but not to give. Uh, I think this is 20 years ago when we last asked about it, organ donation. So that gives you um, a level of superiority, just like the Jews said, we are the, you know, we are the Jews, God's people, and you are the Gentiles. In a similar fashion, does it not then give us that guilt of we shouldn't have anything in our rules that make us superior to other races. So could you expound on that? Because when you say Ummiyin, even God says Rasul was an Ummi. And that there are, therefore, the Ummi word is not a degradatory term. So it doesn't set us apart from, Muslims are not superior in that way, in the commonality of peoples. So when we see these, uh, some rules or restrictions that seem to smack of superiority. Could you tell us more about that? Is there uh, I don't think that ruling, uh, if it's correct, uh, is due to superiority. It's due to uh, uh, impermissibility of self-harm. You cannot harm yourself. Now, if, for example, there's an organ there which from a deceased person, or someone has donated, you can receive it, okay? You, you are not responsible for, for that person, what they are doing, but you are responsible for your own self. Now, the ruling about organ donation is that if during your life, after death, of course, it's quite permissible, they are doing it now in many Muslim countries, there is no superiority in that. If in your life, you want to donate an organ, if it harms your life, shortens your life, you're not allowed to do it. But if it doesn't harm, for example, you give one kidney and you live with another kidney very happily, that's fine, that's very good. There's no problem with that. So the ruling is not because of superiority or anything, it's because of other things that self-harm is not allowed and also uh, and this doesn't make any difference between Muslim and non-Muslim. You can do it, you can donate an organ to a non-Muslim as you can donate to a Muslim. There's no difference. Is that clear? Well, of course, one thing leads to another. So the, what you've said was very clear. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. We've got an idea of that. Um, some other things. So if I was to receive an organ from somebody and he's maybe that person was a drinker. So is there not a limitation to who no, you no, can no. receive No, no, no. Actually, we can receive organs from pigs as well. Uh, just a couple of days ago, I was uh, discussing something with, uh, with a colleague of mine who was in Sweden for a while, and they said, he said that once I was called uh, uh, up from a hospital, and they said that we have a question. There's someone here very ill, and we want to transplant a pig kidney to him, because pig's uh, uh, organs are very compatible with human. Not monkeys, of course, pigs. Now, and uh, they said that we had a case before, and we had an alim. He told us that it's not permissible, a Sunni alim. And he said, I went there, I said, no, it's permissible, that's fine, there's no problem. And they said, what is your uh, your evidence for this, we want to know the evidence. And he said, I brought Tahrir al-Wasil of Imam Khomeini. And it was written there that even if the organ is, is uh, from a pig or any, any other animal, it's fine. So this idea that if this person is a coffer or a woman or, or a drinker or not drinker, it doesn't actually count there. Yeah. You say, Alhamdulillah, if, as if you are going to receive an organ tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. We all might face these questions one day, and then, uh, you know, the next thanks, generation thank asks. Uh, very nice of you to clarify, because there has been an impression amongst us that uh, we cannot give our organ during our lifetime. Um, 
If it's As like, I said, it's very clear yeah. in the fatwa of Ayatollah Khamenei, at yeah. least, and I, I suppose it's the same with others, that if there is no harm, yeah. it, no harm comes to your own life. You know, life and death is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are responsible for our own body and the life Allah has given us. So if giving an organ doesn't harm our life, it's fine. If it harms, it's not permissible. Okay, thank you, Rati. Yeah. Uh, any other sisters? Any brothers? Doctor? Yeah, Riyaz, can you pass the mic? Number three. Alaykum salam. Thank you. I just, if I may, mention a very uh, short uh, reflection on the, the dhikr and shukr it doesn't uh, benefit Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, so why do we do it? I, I just feel that uh, standing in front of God uh, spiritually and recognizing that he is the source of, uh, is the correct way of things. And therefore, the one who doesn't do it is just like uh, an old piece of furniture, say the air conditioning put instead of the toilet, or vice versa. The, the system doesn't work. The completion of the human being and the uh, development doesn't happen because the wrong parts of the recognition of the universe are not in, in place. That's my understanding of the benefit of the curve. Yeah, that's, that's a very good expression. It's the right way of things. It's actually the right standing in the right, going into the right, di right direction of creation. And if we don't do that, we have deprived ourselves of that. And this deprivation uh, is something that majority of human beings bring to themselves, to a level, even us. I mean, to a certain level, we have this hadith that on the day of judgment, the mu'minun who go to paradise, their only remorse is about those minutes and hours and days that they did not remember God. They go there, but their remorse, that's what they lost and that, what they missed actually by not remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is how we are elevated and yeah, it's the right way of doing things. Thank you, any sisters? Or Alaykum, Alaykum, I remember asking uh, another sheikh about how Allah is with me. How do I know how Allah is with me? And he said to me that Allah is with you the same way as you are with him. So if you if you if you know you are not you are lacking, then you are he's lack he he's not lacking but he, you are yeah, distant. Yeah, and we have another hadith which says almost the same thing that if you want to know your worth. In the eyes of Allah, you have to, to see what worth Allah has in your eyes. So to the extent that Allah has value and worth in your eyes, you have value and worth in the eyes of Allah. Thank you. Any brothers? Yeah, yes. Thank, Thank you very Shaykh. much for that. Uh, just to continue about this relationship between ourselves and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In relation to the contract, or the offer of a contract from Allah to us to say, remember me and I will remember you. But if you look at the other part when it says, forget me and I will forget you, does it mean that, and you explained quite eloquently that this is in relation to the blessings that are available to us, does it mean if we forget God, then the blessings are non-existent or that they're there but we don't recognize them? No, they don't come. As I said, there are certain blessings which come whether we remember God or we don't remember God. That's Rahmaniya of Allah, as we discussed before. We say Ar Rahman Ar Rahim. Rahman is someone whose blessings include everyone and everything. This aspect of uh, Allah's attribute. But there's another aspect of Allah's uh, Rahmah which, only, which is only received by those who remember him. And this is, of course, internal spiritual rahmah, which doesn't come. And therefore, someone who doesn't have faith in Allah never receives that rahmah, because that rahmah is something that we have to bring down. It doesn't just come automatically. And uh, it's right, the blessings are there. We do not allow it to come to us. We do not allow it, and we, if we do not allow it to come to us, then you are not included in that, that trauma. Thank you. Any brothers, sisters? Sheikh, we, we believe that uh, 
Well, well, as human beings, we are all sinful, but we believe that prophets and imams are sinless. And yet they, they sort of ask Allah for the forgiveness. And so what is the virtue and wisdom in that? The virtue of what? Well, um, that prophets, why they are sinless? No, no. Or what, why they why are? Why they still uh, pray to Allah for the forgiveness or for the etc. As we have Dua Komel, for example. You know, someone called Isa alayhi salam, Ya Abda Salih, Ya Abda Salih, or Ayyuhal Abdu Salih. This is the Kamuka, Ayyuhal Abdu Salih. And his face became red. And he said, don't call me that, because no one is Salih when compared to the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In fact, no one can give thanks enough. And if we cannot, thank, give, we, can, we cannot give thanks enough to Allah, what should we do? We should ask for forgiveness, isn't it? Now, the closer we go to God, the more we realize this, and the more we feel that Allah should forgive us, the more we feel that we should repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the more we feel that we should ask for his, for his forgiveness. And that's why, awliya Allah, the level of their, uh, their asking for forgiveness, the level of their repentance is much more than us. Why? Because they realize more. Thank you, Ani. Yeah. Sheikh, um, there's a quite a common English phrase, uh, God sent. Um, and, and really, in my life, I've experienced um, I can only describe it as God sent because it couldn't have happened by any of my skills or knowledge or whatever. Um, and I'm sure all of us around the room here can think of such instances, whether it's an action you took or whether the person you were trying to talk to, uh, something happened. So one example is some 20 years ago, as a trustee of, a, of an organization, um, one of my fellow trustees suggested in the morning that we should transfer this amount of money to another account and in 12 o'clock that bank collapsed uh, and uh, I can't explain it, nobody knew about it. Um, so and really th there's absolutely no indication of that was likely to happen. So I mean, such things are the hadith um, which reflect that such things do actually happen? I mean, is, is it just chance or is it truly God's sense? Now, the Muslim philosophers say that there's no chance in this world. Everything is calculated. So they rule out chance completely. There's no luck or anything like that. Yes. So I think they said clearly, you pay focus on God's sense, yeah? That's it. Yeah, that was a good point. <laughs> Uh, but these things happen to everyone in this world. It's not because I'm a mu'min or a kafir. This is from the Rahmani of Allah. You know, Allah, in his Rahmani, Allah does not forget anyone. Even the most ungrateful person, Allah doesn't forget. The Pharaoh, Allah said to Musa, go to him and speak softly and politely. Maybe he remembers, maybe he takes heed. So still, for own Allah doesn't forget and gives the blessings like anyone in this world who is kafir, mushrik, whatever. These are all from Rahmaniya. But these things doesn't happen in a spiritual life. In spiritual life, you need to have remembrance of Allah so that these blessings come. Of course, there are moments for everyone, mu'min, kafir, awliya Allah, ordinary believers, that Allah sends a breeze of this spiritual blessing, which includes everyone, so that some people repent, some people come to their mind, but still these breezes are reminders, people should repent to him. So yes, these things happen, and especially if we ask Allah for them, it comes. If we ask Allah for these material blessings, he gives us. But it's very general. It's for everyone. Probably on that day that this happened to you, it may have happened to several other non-Muslims or kuffar as well, that they did it and they thought that, whoa, this was a great blessing. Thank you. Any, yeah. So how much was it? <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.
Assalamu alaikum. Thank you so much for your explanation. I uh, just want to ask you, what is Islam says about ventilator? If the person is dying, and if you start a ventilator, if still breathing, are you supposed to switch it off or you can you have to wait? Now, this is the, for the Maharaj to say, what I know is that uh, Ayatollah Khamenei says, as long as you haven't connected that, you're fine. You don't need to. You don't have to. But when you have connected the person to a ventilator to machine, then you shouldn't cut it off. Except if the, 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 the medics say that, for example, we need it for someone who has priority or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's better originally not to put someone that we know is of no use to connect to a machine. But when you connect to a machine, because disconnecting is like killing, isn't it? There's a hope. You always hope that. Uh... So you shouldn't disconnect then. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jamil. Yeah, this thing that you mentioned about there is no luck that was sort of struck me suddenly. So you're saying everything's planned. So what you suddenly get or benefits or whatever is is not something that's lucky. It's already been planned, and the same thing applies to the disasters and everything else. Everything's planned, is that what, yeah. what you said? Or? Any a misfortune which hits you, whether around you in the earth or about yourself, is already written in a book before it comes about. So it's already planned, isn't it? Now, think about this way. Can Allah be surprised by something. I'm taken by surprise. Something happens that he doesn't know before. Could it be possible? No, 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 there's not possible. So there's no but, luck. but he's not surprised, I am surprised. Well, that's, so that's, that's a different matter altogether. Eh? Okay, you are surprised because you don't know about it. Okay? The fact that we don't know about it is not, does not mean that it's not written somewhere, that it's not planned. We don't know about it. So that's why we say that there cannot be any luck in this world. Everything should be, have been planned, but because of our ignorance of them, we are taken by surprise, we think it was luck, we think it was a misfortune or bad luck or something like that. But we pray and we hope things get avoided and everything else. If it's all planned, it doesn't obviously... No, that plan can change by your change. luck. That's right. Yeah, of course. So that's what I'm saying. The luck, the plan may be changed. Yeah? By luck, no. By your dua. Not by By luck. the dua, yes. Yeah, by <laughs> dua it can be changed, yes. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Any brother? Last one? Yeah. Or by a good action. A good action may change the whole, whole direction. Or bad action may change the direction of things. But it's still, it's all planned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, I, when I came, I think you were talking about this. I'm not sure whether I understood it correctly or not. But uh, I think you said that um, in the previous scriptures or previous religions, it had been mentioned that the Prophet will come with two Qiblas. And so this was a final argument that uh, to show that the Prophet was, this was the Prophet who prayed uh, for, you know, towards two Qiblas. Uh, it couldn't have been in the Jewish scriptures because uh, the Jews were the ones who objected to the fact that he had turned away. Um, I can't think of it as being the Mushrikun who would have had anything to suggest that he's going to come, who's going to pray to two Qiblas. So where, and where would this be coming from? In, in, in you know, which scripture? No, as I said, the scripture that uh, uh, they had w w was probably different from the Torah that we read today. They had a different version of it there. And the Quran mentions, And many Exodus say that they know this change of Qibla is a special feature of this Prophet as they know their sons. Something like that. Now, maybe the expression I don't remember exactly. 
what happens, they conceal the truth. So they were concealing this from the public or twisting the meaning. And uh, this is why many Jews, of course, were confused about it. Yeah. Do you have to check when you are in the need of blood? Do you have to check who's, where it's coming from, which person? Or no, 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 because not. there's no harm in blood transfusion, isn't it? I mean, no, you no can harm, give blood or you can receive but blood. But we always say the blood has a lot of what you eat, your blood is made of. And then does it affect uh, if it comes into your body? It just says a... Uh, from Fekhi point of view, no. There is no, there is no difference. But maybe you... Spiritually, you think that I don't want this blood or I don't want that blood. Yeah. In giving blood or receiving blood? Receiving. Well, receiving blood, you know, you have no ch choice. I mean, you are in the hospital. So, uh, otherwise, you don't receive blood, you know. You are in, 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 There has been a, uh, a scandalous uh, spread of infection over many years to thousands of people. So I, I, I'm not arguing that we should or should not take blood. Uh, it's just claiming there is no harm is inaccurate. Yeah, that's all. That's true. Okay. Provided there is infection, of course. Yeah. yeah. Infection, lower yeah. immunity also sustained. Thank you, Sheikh. I think Muhammad Wali, Muhammad Salawat. Um, do we continue next Sunday? Sure. Thank